coming off of our break where we had some pure water and some refreshing fruit, prasad, sanctified food. So this transmission can go on unimpeded with pure prana and pure thoughts because from pure food you get pure uh, energy and from pure energy you get pure mind and from pure mind, pure thoughts. And from that you get Brahman. So we are gradually but graciously and greatly looking forward to seeing Brahman in everything. Uh, it's not given to very many people to see Brahman in its formless essence. You'd have to have nirvikalpa or asamprigyata or uh, isolation from nature, from unmanifested prakriti to be the witness, to get even a glimpse of that and uh, not fall into it like a hailstone into the ocean. For great souls, we're talking about dewdrops, how they fall. But for great souls, they're more like hailstones of massive size. And they fall into an ocean and just dissolve there in their own essence. So those kinds of thoughts make for thinking about Brahman. If you never have those kinds of thoughts, it's going to be very rare that you would think about Brahman or Brahman might occur to you. And it's probably why people are saying, oh, I want to go see the sunset today, or let's go to the ocean, or let's take a vacation, or let's go to Machu Picchu, or let's do whatever around the worlds of name and form, <coughs> and not see that divine reality in all of it, or know that it's the divine reality behind it all that's giving it its attraction. That's a nice question to ask yourself if you're enjoying a sunset or looking at a beautiful scene out the window. What is it that's giving it its marvelous attraction? Because it couldn't be this thing itself, because if I go look at the field and get down to the grass and then look underneath that, there's mud and then insects, and oh, look out for that centipede. So uh, nature veils horrible things potentially horrible things and pain and suffering are there in it, inherent in it. The soul is all bliss, all peace, all love, all light, but it has to realize itself and it'll do that by separating itself from nature. That's what Koivalya means in yoga. It's a penultimate stage towards seedless samadhi. Asampragyata, it's called seedless samadhi, which is the equivalent to nirvikalpa in Advaita Vedanta, I would say. So you'd have to separate yourself from nature. Isolation would be the final move in this inward moving process of dissolution of the mind stream, like taking the intelligent particles back to their source or to the word, as we were saying, uh, in order to have that unmixed, pure vision of the Absolute. Brahman. In the meantime, on the way there, or if you've fallen far out, you've got Chittabhasa happening to you. This is where we're picking up as we left off. As we've just said that Brahman appearing as various principles. So Sri Ramakrishna's quote about Brahman appearing as the 24 cosmic principles is being proved here in this Chittabhasa system which is one of India's precious systems. And might as well go ahead and read one of our own Western savants poems here. My teacher used to quote this a lot because he was looking for Westerners to produce free souls. He was looking for the West to, to produce a Jivan Mukta. And uh, it wasn't happening. Why? Because he said, because you haven't gotten beyond the intellectual frame of reference. You're great thinkers. But in the poets and in the musicians and some of the artists, maybe even in a few scientists, they were beginning to think beyond the box or outside the box in that way and look for an ultimate source that was inside rather than backwards in time or theology looking upwards in space to some heaven up there. So this kind of ideation and probably much of it coming from the Vedas and the Upanishads because the Westerners were encountering that like Walt Whitman and other beings were going into cabins, into woods, isolating themselves and reading the Upanishads. 
and the Gita. And so it was very apropos that Vivekananda, who we just sang about at the end of the first half, had come amongst us in 1893 and opened us on, up to that, turned us on to it, as they say. Turned us on, opened our noddies and turned us on to tracing the light. If the hound of heaven couldn't find you, then you had to become the hound and seek out that heaven. Uh, that's the difference between grace coming to you or you doing practice and getting to grace. You're much better off in the second version of that. You become the hound of heaven and seek God, because otherwise it's very unlikely that God's going to come into your soccer field or into your TV or into your body-mind mechanism. Uh, will you even recognize it or that or him or her if you're, if you're all of a sudden introduced to Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother? in this lifetime, as we were when we were in our late teens. So Brahman is appearing as various principles, and I mentioned that word at the beginning of the first half, Brahmagyan or Atmagyan. It's different than, than Agyan or Michigan or even Apara Gyan. It's, 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 or just jnana. Jnana is words and teachings you're getting from the scriptures, and that's going to be very good for you. It's like dharma, what I'm trying to help here by transmitting. But beyond that is, Brahma Gyan is from your direct spiritual experience. As you've already had that great revelation, call it wheat separating the wheat from the chaff, or Brahman is real, the world's not real in whatever way you've reached it, through other method, whichever way you have it, in whatever temperament, is whatever path it's introduced to you through, according to your kind of temperament, then you have Brahmagyan, then you're set. <laughs> a funny statement, you're set for life, you see, here in the world, if you've got money, right? Well, you're set for eternal life if you have Brahmagyan. Let's be set for eternal life. You'll have to some, open up some avenue by which you see all of this as a reflection of Brahman, Chittabhasa. So if you have a word in another language, namely Sanskrit now, and you hear it from a teacher who's realized it, like a mantra, or a sloka, or a sutra, or a sura, then basically you're having this first taste of what could become Brahma again. and that hound is in hot pursuit of heaven. When, when you get that, you have a taste for it, and nothing will deter you after that. Nothing will, will turn you away, like a bloodhound after a, a criminal. You know, the, the sincere seeker is after the criminal is his own ignorance. So from there on down, and from there on up, we're, we're, I'm speaking right now, from there on down, or we would say out, from kingdoms of heaven within you out, then you come upon these principles which are in flux, more in flux. If you enter Brahma again, it's like jumping into a cool ocean, a hot person jumping into a cool, cool ocean, and you can't find the end of it. But if you enter the worlds of prana, even if it's at a very refined level, you see that it can give way to all things with names, all things with forms, all things in time, all things in space, all things attended by karma. Those are five things called maya, if you put all five of those together. So prana would be what the illumined soul would, would pick up. These movies lately about taming your dragon, these animated silly things that they're putting out there. They really have a deeper meaning if you looked into it, because prana is that Garuda bird, the, the great winged dragon, Garutman. And uh, he will, if you get on his back as a great soul, he can take you in a pure way into the realms of name and form of the ancestors, the, the uh, elementals, and finally human beings, animals, and insects. 
those realms, the three lower chakras, if you want to put it that way. So there's the assignment next coming as you see the arrows coming down. You see Chittabhasa, the reflection is getting more dense. The wind is blowing harder on your lake. See where you parted the green scumps, you can't see yourself very well. The denser it gets, the farther away you are from the source or the more impeded your intelligent particles become. You're not holding on to your focus. Jnana matras are the most powerful force in the universe. They're Shakti's own way of moving. So if you can't hold on to that as a soul and things become foggy or hazy, that's why. It's because um, you're not able to hold that higher consciousness <coughs> the way a bodhisattva could or the way a jivan mukta could or the way Ishvara manifesting as an avatar could, or a great seer could. So there you see it, pretty prana and akasha, I put those kind of together. Subtle energy, the subtle worlds, and higher gradated beings that are in them. So you'd be probably being introduced to gods and goddesses, they call those devas and devis. And it, falling lower, or out, further out in the spectrum, they'd be called suras and asuras because you start to get some negative mixture into the beings you're meeting. Beings who have more desire for power, domination. That's where the beings of this world come from who are into domination and power. They have a strong desire for that. Statesmen, politicians, scientists to a great degree who get together with them coming from that realm of asuras, you see, because they want to come back to the world. They think that's so important to come back and dominate the whole world. Someone wants to do it for the first time, but it's never happened. There's a sail safe there in Shakti's intelligence. It's called the illumined soul is waiting there for them. They won't be able to get through and dominate the whole world because try and do that with India. Let's see. Attila the Hun tried it with India. Alexander the Great tried it with India. Hit, uh, Napoleon tried it with India. Hitler tried it with India. The English tried it with India. Too many illumined souls. Too many revealed scriptures, which I'll get to next. Too much time had passed in thinking about Brahman and all the systems that would arm you against thinking in the wrong way, or not thinking at all about divine reality. Coming to such a failed position of your own consciousness is to think that matter was real. What's wrong with you? And what, what can be done for you at that point? Well, that pretty much explains the next arrow, which points us to the human ego mind complex. This is where thought, conceptualization, visions, imagination, projection, invention, and desire all appear in that antaha karna, which is the inner cause, karna, antaha, inner, of everything that's to follow. So that mind created the worlds. Brahman didn't do it. Nature couldn't do it alone. Nature just played a part in it. Uh, but the mind complex produced the worlds and the bodies and selected the parents from the ancestor pool. And this has been known for a long time is how the dynamics of this whole cycle works. But as I said earlier, if you don't know that you're in a cycle, even though everything around you is cycling, then you're not going to come upon such insights as that or believe in them if you do. That's called pretty much Sankalpa and Vikalpa and we looked at it at this previous in this previous chart. You see Sankalpa Vikalpa is really at the foundation of that whole circle going both directions of everything. There's even a kind of Sankalpa that the Trinity does. They'll take the seeds given to them by Shakti, who's the witness of everything and she'll say, okay, produce the worlds of name and form and time and space for me, starting with the causal so that the seers can have subtle bodies, 
going to the subtle so the gods and goddesses can have their play, and then right on down to the gross, where human beings, plants, and animals, and everything that's seen, unseen, and obscene can happen. And this is what's meant by time and space comes next. In the meantime, I introduced this great poet and the quote, the poem, part of the poem that my guru, Swami Sheshananji Maharaj, peace and bliss be upon him, often quoted from the podium in his Vedanta lectures. That was, of course, Shelley. The one remains, the many change and pass. Heaven's light forever shines. Earth's shadows fly. Life, like a dome of many colored glass, stains the white radiance of eternity. So Chittabhasa is a dome of many colored glass. Maybe at the very center of the dome is a clear glass where the sun can come straight down, the sun of divine reality. That flash of lightning that we were talking about in an earlier chart can come right through the center of that. And its ray will cause light, the light of Brahman to be in everything as a reflection. If you use a little bit of sort of discrimination against false superimposition. But in the meantime, there are many other plates of glass in that great dome of the great mind. And the sun, the sunshine of eternity there, is the, the, the light, the white radiance of eternity, Shelley's talking about, is beaming through all those different colored glasses. And they're each becoming a different tattva. That's the light of Brahman that's causing all that. It's a very good way of explaining the title of our class series here, Brahmapada. Brahman disports itself around the universe. So that's the very light of Brahman, but it's getting colored green, red, blue, and so forth by this dome of many colored glass. So it's a very beautiful, well thought out idea by Shelley. We wonder what scriptures he was reading when maybe he came upon that idea in that beautiful poem. It's probably recorded somewhere. But some of the light reflected through those plates of glass, colored plates of glass, come in here as five elements, five gross elements, physical universe, flow of events, phenomena, karma. That is the cause and effect that comes from light being shown so far out and having to come against something like a leaf or a rock instead of a, 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 um, a lake or a mirror because the great soul will be like the mirror and the uh, savat will be like the lake but ordinary pers person will be like a leaf shining off very little light and the, the stunted intelligence the brute the beast the low thinker would be like the rock. Very little light shining on that. And so you have human embodiment in this rendering of Chittabhasa, how the light shines at different levels in different ways as it comes down through this great dome of the Mahat. Five senses of knowledge, five senses of action in the body appear. And it's not necessary in the order of how Samkhya puts it or yoga wants you to meditate upon it but it's in an order that makes a lot of sense for the degree of reflection that occurs when light hits the many different worlds or the different kinds of beings in them and then right on down to this quote by Vashishta we see here the embodied being is none other than a combination of the jnana wisdom of Brahman, an emanation of the jnana wisdom of Brahman. So it sounds much like Gaudapada when he's talking about uh, the Atman. The hosts of myriad worlds and objects appear within endless cycles of time, duly shining as the objective vision and identity 
of it inherent in consciousness. Thus, it is the one all-pervading Atman which assumes the name of Jiva. Manifesting with the intelligent force of its own innate awareness. So some very powerful words there with uh, Lord Vashishta's take on it in a very early time. It's one of the ten mind-born sons of Ishvara, of Lord Brahma. You're talking about an emanation of a soul with so much light who came from Brahma, Lord Brahma, the Trinity. He had ten of those mind-born sons, they say. So Vashishta was one of those. So uh, it reminds us actually that that vision of God and everything has been sung before. But it says, Jafar, this great realized being who decides to put this in a song, uh, what cannot really be sung and described with words, yet he gives an attempt. He says in this verse, from the life heavens, throughout the boundless universes, and even into the dark nether regions. Whatever our, wherever our souls journey, we find only thee. So there's Brahman, disporting in all these things. Nothing exists but thee. So I have finally understood, O Lord, that everything exists in thee. Isn't it back up here to our God is with, not in the universe, the universe is within God. How Vivekananda put it in a much later time. So he says, I finally understood everything exists in thee. Every heart is ultimately united in thee. Nothing exists but thee. He's having this grand realization and trying to communicate it to us through words and notes in a very beautiful way. And so that tops off nicely this teaching on Chittabhasa, which we'd like to try and look at maybe once a year. One of the great effective systems that have been composed or authored by these great souls of India called rishis, seers, yogis, yoginis, and uh, founders of the great darshanas of India, like the father of yoga and Vedanta, and Lord Kapila of the Samkhya system. They all concur on this. Each age to age, they just keep putting it in ways that you can look at it a little bit differently, probably according to the way beings are seeing things, because we know this kind of materialistic problem that began on the scene might have been some 2,000 years old in India. This Patanjali at 140 AD was talking about how the seer had become enslaved to the scene. And so the way he put forth yoga, eight-limbed in that time, was to get the seer to detach from the scene by meditating upon the scene as a lumbanas, stations of meditation. If I didn't give you the English definition to that word earlier, lumbana means a station to meditate upon because some Brahman light is in it and then some of it is insentient. You have to know the difference between the real and the unreal. And so in this way, all the great souls have contributed to great systems like Chittabhasa. Now, I want to move over to another way in which Brahman disports itself, and that's this, through the revealed scriptures that I've mentioned several times. And um, since Shankar's birthday is in two days, and I'll be giving a talk on sadhana, spiritual practice, moksha, liberation, which is always in you and on hand, and the Jivan Mukta, that is the living liberated soul, or Jivan Mukti, the station of liberation, then I should uh, present this beautiful chart to you. And it starts off with one of the quotes by him. The revealed scriptures and spiritual preceptors of the world have their existence through the Atman. Faith, devotion, and constant communion with the wise, these are declared by the scriptures to be the seeker's direct means to realizing the Atman. It is hard for any embodied being to achieve a human form, strength, and purity. More difficult still is the desire to live a spiritual life. And hardest of all is cultivating an ability to comprehend the Holy Scriptures. 
which are the words of these great souls. It's actually in the first 54 slokas of the Viveka Chudamani. If you, the way I looked at it, I took that 54 sloka bite and made a chart out of it called The Eight Steps to Spiritual Success. It starts out with a human body. I started thinking I might talk about that in my talk coming up in Shankar, but when I got to human body, I had 25 minutes of things to say about it. <laughs> so uh, it would have used up all my time. Then I would have got to strength, you know, strength and uh, all the things that follow thereafter in that, in that eight-step rise to success in spiritual life, which few people are having in this day. To, it's very hard to keep up a life in the world, it's hard to keep up a sadhana in the world too, just like it's hard to, to comprehend the scriptures. You have people coming around uh, in your family, say, here, we're going to study the scriptures, young man or young woman. Not happening. So when we talk about revealed scriptures, we talk about a country, Mother India, called Bharat back then, and India in these days now, which is the mother of all religions, we like to say, and there's plenty of evidence about that. Even on the level of revealed scriptures alone, you can see at the bottom of this chart just a host of several dozen revealed scriptures that I'm not going to go into today and to, to finish out this class, but you'll, you'll see them all there in the list. Those are just a few. When I made this chart, I walked out with a notebook to my own bookshelf and started writing down the ones that were there that were the most prominent, and then walked back in and put it into a list here and created this chart for it. So these are Scriptures that are revealed mean Brahman is in them more than Brahmapada. It's, it's sporting through words. So shouldn't you take the words and merge them in the mind, then take the mind, merge it into the intellect, then take it and merge it into the ego and then into the witness, as he said. Now do you understand what they mean by that? Get your mind full of higher grade mantras get it rid of all of the lower grade mantras, uh, gossip, fault finding being the worst of them, and then just normal everyday worldly talk, which burned my ears, which I want to go into silence and solitude to get away from, and then fill myself with these words of Brahman. This is Brahman sporting through books even. And these books are not just ordinary books. If you want to put it in terms of a similarity to Brahmapada, quickly, did I? Oh, it's here. See how I turned, uh, I came right down the spectrum of the Katatvas with this quick right hand column. Cosmic intelligence, I said first thing out the door, or cosmic mind, the Mahat into, that is, the light flowing through the many colored glasses of those, that big dome, turns into ego, intellect, mind, and thought. That's the fourfold mind. Next comes the subtle elements and senses, audibility, tangibility, visibility, flavor, and odor. Then comes hearing, feeling, seeing, tasting, and smelling, speaking, handling, locomotion, procreating, and excreting all the way down to the very elements of earth, and there's Brahman sporting in the human form right here. Embodiment, the body, the five senses, knowledge, that was all because Brahman was there. And Brahman's light did not get affected or diminished or increased by any of those moves, those so-called moves, because it's actionless. It's pafaft. We know that already. So that's just a quick ladder, you see, oops, over here. That's just a quick ladder from, and if you want to put it in Sanskrit, there's, in old terms, Hiranyagarbha means a mass of, of uh, radiance, you see. Hiranyagarbha, it's the cosmic egg, they call that sometimes. So everything is like in a perfect, perfect in, the, in the egg form. And 
Mahat Bodhi, Ahamkara, Manas, and Chitta, which are all listed right there at the top, are there in that first step. You see one there on that footprint, two on this footprint, three on this footprint, four on this footprint, and five on this footprint as Brahman steps in its four feet, you might say, down onto the very terrain of Terra. <laughs> right on down to Earth it comes. And if it's not text tortured, then the scriptures hold it. If it's not used by an inferior intellect, then the scriptures emanate it. That same wisdom that's coming to us in the Upanishads, which causes a great poet to write a great poem, or a great savant to go to the woods and retreat and meditate on the Atman, when maybe he hasn't heard that phrase for ever or for lifetimes, then that's that impetus of Brahman and its Shakti coming through everything. Five steps. Usually it takes five steps. The second step would be Sparsha, Shabda, Sparsha, Rupa, Rasa, and Gandha. Shabda Brahman, that's sound. When you read a book, there's a silent sound in every word, isn't there? You don't think of it that way. But you, you, your mind is echoing a sound inside your head. And then you put a bunch of them together. Then you merge it with your mind. Then you merge it into your intellect. Think about it. Then you merge it into your ego and uh, defeat the ego's possession of it. See it all as mothers. And then finally put it into the witness. And you're climbing back up these five steps and when you're doing that. So that's, of course, your audibility, tangibility, visibility, flavor, and odor. Rasa. So if we go to eat good Indian food, you say, what are you enjoying? Rasa. That's that taste of the Indian spices, you see. So it can be there in the food and the gross taste. But it starts out at a very subtle level that will eventually later turn into the knowledge senses and the taste buds. and sight, fire that gives you sight and so forth, water that gives you the taste. Try eating Indian food without water, <laughs> especially down south. <laughs> so then you've got Gyanandriyas next, Shravandriya, Sparshandriya, Chakshurandriya, Rasanandriya, Kranandriya. Those are, of course, these knowledge senses. Hearing, shravana, so I must hear. My sense of hearing must be attuned to the teacher's voice so that those words of subtle essence can ignite in me the jnana matras. Fo bring them together in a great focus so that I can penetrate through all the, all the reflections, chitabhasa, with a sort of wisdom, vivartapada, and see Brahman sporting and everything, but first I have to see Brahman itself. That's my journey right now, like up to seven chakras. And then the Karmandriyas, Vagandriya, Hastanandriya, Padandriya, Upastandriya, Payuandriya, are all the Sanskrit words ancient for the active senses. And then there you see step five is Pancha Mahabhutas, Vyoma Marut Teja Ap and Kshiti. It just pretty much sounds like it is in both languages, doesn't it? So basically, Vyoma, Mari, Teja, Ap, and Kshiti is Pancha Mahabhutas. That is the five great elements. And so all right on down through intelligence at the very highest level into the books, into the revealed scriptures. So. I didn't quite tell the complete truth. I'm, I'm not going to skip this completely. I'm going to point out to you two of these scriptures at the bottom, which I think are most pertinent to today. The Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna and the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. Those are fresh, new dispensation scriptures, which hold in them <coughs> everything you want to know about spiritual life, to quote a phrase, from soup to nuts. Everything is there of a nutritious manner in, in the form of Brahman nutrition. How Brahman got into everything, even into the food. 
But if I didn't see it there and benefit fr from it, then my food was just giving me poisoned blood and poisoned mind and poisoned food. As who said? Lord Vashishta. Probably where Holy Mother got it when she said, from pure food you get pure blood, and from pure blood you get pure mind. So you have to keep that element of food very, very pure, and then move it in to get ojas and tejas. All of these systems I've quoted from maybe four or five of them, with three or four different systems in this half alone, or in this class alone. So I'm saying that they'll get that uncovered revolution, uh, re revelation of truth if you pick up the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And it's not just me or my order or the Ramakrishna order of Swamis that's saying that. Teachers from other traditions are saying that now. If you want to know everything about spiritual life, get the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Our own founder of SRV here found it on the bookshelf of the Vedanta Society in New York that was at the time under the auspice of Swami Nikilananda, whom initiated him, like Sikson, into the path. And uh, that gospel of Ramakrishna was right there with fragrant incense all around it when he pulled it off the shelf. And uh, I myself, too, the first spiritual book I ever read was the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. I read a, one or two other books that were supposed to be spiritual, and I found them to be entirely hollow and misleading. They were talking about occult powers, levitating, and uh, uh, the ego, autobiographies of somebody writing about themselves and so forth. Those things uh, I just passed. I knew right away they weren't the real article. Then the Gospel of Ramakrishna, here we are. Here we are. The avatar of the age has come. Didn't I just chant it? A chandala pratita paraya, yasya prema prabhavo, Sita hi Ramaha. Sita, the beloved of Rama, of Sita, has come again, Sri Ram. So Vivekananda had to write that song. He didn't write books. They're collected from his talks. So many he gave. So this is right from, straight from the horse's mouth, or you might say the cow's mouth in this way of speaking. But um, he did write songs and a few poems, and those are powerful. So I bring that up quickly of mention, and you can look back on this class and close up and see all these beautiful scriptures like uh, Gita, Upanishads, and mother scriptures, non-dual scriptures like Ashtravaka Samhita, which Sri Ramakrishna is the only book he kept near him in his life. He was rather beyond books and scriptures. He was a walking universal scripture on consciousness itself. But the Ashtavakra Samhita, he wanted that around for Swamiji to read when he was young and to introduce that Advaita in, in the most unique way. The I and my father principle, as it was expressed in India for thousands of years before Jesus came in the Middle East. So this leads us just to one last quote here uh, as we do a quick run through how Brahman disports itself through the wisdom word, if you want to put it that way, or Shabda, because Shabda starts off a lot uh, on, on all levels, doesn't it? Hearing the truth, contemplating the truth, and realizing the truth. Starts with hearing. So Swami Vivekananda says it nice here, I have never lost faith in a benign providence, nor am I ever going to lose it. My faith in the true religion and revealed scriptures remains unshaken. So he would, we, we can even sing about that. He would be one of those who would go up to the Himalayas and the only thing he would take with him besides his wearing cloth and meditation clothes and so forth would be a, a scripture. So he'd occasionally come out of his meditation sitting there in the snows in the Himalayas and take up the scripture and read it and think about it, savor it, these great slokas, ancient from the great teachers of which he was one, there on earth in a, in a more recent time. So we often like to sing to him about that. Sugandha Shri Guru Bhavam Vayu Kalu 
Saturyam twa jabaho Maho chair go shakaha Guru suryas to hey kiladar so bevan Viveka nandate Prabhati pranjali Narendra shashave Narendra yovane Yarendra kridane Narendra shikshane Narendra palane Narendra kharpane Viveka nandate Prabhati pranjali Viveka nandate Prabhati Pranjali Om. And this beautiful hymn by a living luminary, one of the great Swamis of the Ramakrishna order is sung this beautiful verse out of all of them. O perfect one, talking about Swami Vivekananda, if Sri Ramakrishna is the flower, you are the wind that carries its fragrance to all beings. If he is the royal brass ensemble, you are the musical fanfare of breathtaking beauty and inspiration. Your master is the radiant sun, and you are the various surfaces upon which its light gets reflected. There's the word chitabhasa. Therefore, in this auspicious dawn of illumination, O Vivekananda, we offer you our devoted salutations. So there's, to end this chart, which is rather a quick view of it, we come right on back to the principle of Brahmapada through not only a great soul like Sri Ramakrishna and another great soul following him like Swami Vivekananda, but also the very scriptures that they taught and through which they worked their way to earth and which they brought with them to earth. Thanks to the Ramakrishna order, Swami Vivekananda on earth in the late 1800s, in early 1900s when the Mott and Mission were formed now followed by five million people, as I said, at least, then we find out all these translations in different languages going out from the Ramakrishna order. And we have our share of them here in, in America, in English. All of these that I've lifted here, and many more, of course, are in English for us. Talk about a great work. Hopefully it reminds you, those of you who are following his teachings, of the four teachings of Shivapada. It's even a Brahmapada, but there are four feet of Shiva that he brings the scriptures to earth and protects them and brings luminaries and certain duties and dharmas that you have around them. That was a teaching that was last week. So if your memory is good, you'll remember that. So beautiful there as we wrap up this class with the chart that comes next. We are moving through the charts quite easily in fight readily. And uh, since we've been talking in Chittabhasa fashion and revealed scripture fashion, all the way right down to speaking, handling, loco locomotion, procreation, excreting, ether, air, fire, water, and earth, these are all these great principles down here under the auspice of the prana, which people don't know about, and also manifestations of Brahman here, which people don't know about and actually created by their own minds, which people don't know about. <laughs> so what do they know? Just matter as it appears. But there's another way in which this can be looked at because those people who desperately want to know something deeper than the five elements or what science is proposing or what religion or irreligion, if you want to call it that, is trying to foist on people nowadays, they would 
think about this as another kind of reflection. This is how consciousness gets reflected right here in nature, in the five elements. And here's a chart which you've probably only seen once, if that, which I created uh, this year or early last year. There's my teacher's quote. Light reflects poorly off a rock, reflects better off a leaf. Off of a pool of water, it reflects even better, but off of a mirror, it reflects best of all. So I was in his ashram listening to his discourse when I noted that down and uh, wrote it down later and <coughs> remembered it as a great teaching of how light gets reflected to a greater, middling, or lesser degree as it comes down the spectrum. So how much light is in earth, how much light is in water, how much light is in sun, fire, and how much light is in the uh, air and ether. How many suns are in the ether? That's only just on the physical level. So people are looking out to that physical level, desperately trying to find Brahman there. So let's go back to that quote real quick. God is not in the universe. The universe is in God. So if you are looking for God here, you're you could be looking for God in all the wrong places, to change the lyrics of a song, popular song. But you can see here that you're not that far off base if you are following those teachings of Vivartapadna and Chittabhasa and uh, Alambana meditation of the father of yoga, the Eight Limbed Yoga. And some of these quotes might clear that up for us even better. First of all, though, let's slap ourselves in the face with another one of Swamiji's quotes. The only knowledge that is of any value is to know that all this is humbug. But few, very few, will ever know this. Quote from the Upanishads. Know the Atman alone and give up all other vain words. Unquote. This is the only knowledge we gain from all this knocking about the universe. So taking a very strict and non-dualistic view that, oh, I looked for God here everywhere, and uh, I decided I would go back to the source and find it in full. And as I did, no matter what, what method I used, I, I left off the rock and its reflection of light. I left off the leaf. I left off the lake, and I left off the mirror, and that's how I worked my way back up to tattvas in the way that they came out. And when I found the great tattva, the mahat, the great mind, I went beyond that and I found the seeds for everything in Prakriti. And then I found I was the Purusha with those seeds in me, that all of nature was within me. And uh, I can't tell you the many ways in which he said that in his letters to people. Here's some of them. And here's what I mentioned about the jnana matra, the powerful particles. Though knowledge being a compound cannot be the absolute, it is the nearest approach to it, and higher than desire or will, conscious or unconscious. The divine first becomes the mixture of knowledge, then in the second degree it becomes that of will. So the first compound, the first admixture off of pure conscious awareness is this wisdom. Brahmagyan, we called it in the other chart. So imagine if you put your mind on that, how quickly you would come to know how close you were to the, you were at the penultimate state of the highest wisdom, and it was just one more step until everything dissolved into that light. You found that in yourself. And that's why you slowly gave up hoping for anything to happen in the universe of name and form. Probably even in heaven, you gave up the heaven-aspiring senses and said, I want to go beyond heaven, the third chakra. Then you arrived at the love of God in the heart. Ah, this is it, this is it. And then a few people wanted to go deeper and deeper, all the way to the third eye. As we were discussing um, a couple weeks ago in our Gyanachakshu class. So all around this chart, which is an easy study, I put 
a hand coming out of a tree branch. I put uh, a Buddha there in the spring. I put Om there up in the tree branch, in, in, in the mother of Shakti up there with the Om in her third eye. There are little indications of this. What I didn't have to Photoshop in, as I say, was all these beautiful fish down here in this, in this picture that I used and uh, modified. And there you see uh, another of Swami Sheshananda's quote in this regard. He said, if consciousness were to reflect out and identify with the element of water, it could assume the form of a fish. If it were to identify mainly with two of the five senses, like hearing and smelling, it might take on a dog's form. If it were to identify with the unripe human ego, it would become an ignorant human being. And if it were to identify with the refined human mind, it would become an intelligent being. So from time out of mind, the lesson we're learning, you see, is to, is to see gradated consciousness and everything in this rendering right on down to the fish sporting in the pool. How many people wouldn't get attracted to seeing that? Watching the koi in a, a pool in a shopping center or, or, or uh, going to a, a mountain lake and seeing the fish sport there. And, uh, or seeing a dog, you know, the intelligence, as it were, in the dog's eye, and, and not feel that there's a living presence there that is not necessarily the dog, it's not necessarily the nose and the ears of the dog, which are most sensitized, so not necessarily the, the uh, body of the dog, uh, but and, and not just the prana of the dog, because that will go away when your dear pet passes and dies when that form passes. But the kind of intelligence sits there in everything, uh, reflected there, Brahman reflected there. This is why you love things, fish, dogs, and uh, your children. The consummate aspirant, knowing that all of these things are just reflections, just reflections, or just superimpositions, just false superimpositions, or, or just things to be meditated upon, just things to be meditated upon, or things to be deified, things to be deified. There you've got uh, things that are empty, things that are empty. <laughs> there you've got the look of Buddhism going backwards in, the look of yoga, the look of Tantra, the look of Vedanta, and the look of Samkhya. All of these, looking at it in a slightly different way, all of them concurring in the end. Brahman is just sporting here. All this is Brahman, is the ultimate conclusion. Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Resha, Brahmaiva Jivaham Sakalam Jagatcha, Akanda Rupa Stiti Reva Moksho, Brahmadvitiye Shrutayaha Pramanam. From Shankara, whose birthday is the day after tomorrow. It is the final conclusion of Vedanta that all is Brahman. This is the system that gave us discrimination between the real and unreal. That God's not in the universe, the universe is in God. But still, the final conclusion of the Brahman, of the Vedanta, that all this is Brahman. Even time, space, living beings, they're all just Brahman too. Living in constant recognition of this fact is what's called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect and one without a second. Brahma Dvitiye. That's called enlightenment then, enlightenment then when you keep that in mind. So you see this chart opens up a lot to us here on earth as we are amongst the five elements, using the five senses to experience everything called objects, all connected to our brain. And hopefully we will some, at some point connect it to our mind is one of my signature and favorite teachings because we're seeing that the Indian schools are all mind only schools, that they know that everything came from an inner source and mind wouldn't be the ultimate source. It'd be not even the penultimate source. Your intelligence would be that. More inner, inward would be the word, as we've seen in these charts already. 
I think there is one more quote here we can take in the remaining time. And this is uh, one of my favorites about how to explain that Brahman is here and not here. Vivekananda says, it is said that plants have no consciousness, that they are at best unconscious wills. The answer is that even this unconscious plant will is a manifestation of the consciousness, not of the plant, but of the cosmos, the Mahat of Samkhya philosophy. Or didn't I say that Advaita and Samkhya at the two ends were concurring with each other? So you don't look at the plant and say, oh, that's Brahman. You don't look at the body and say, oh, is that Brahman? You say, that's not Brahman. Neti neti, you discriminate that away. But you say the Mahat's in everything. It's in the plant. See, it's in your body. Its prana is everywhere. And so this is how you make some sense out of something that otherwise could be very confusing, not only to a person who has not heard the Dharma yet, but to very advanced people along the path of spirituality who don't understand the philosophy yet, haven't spent enough time hearing it, shravana, rolling it over in their mind, manana, and nidijasana. In this lifetime alone, I'm speaking to you these systems I've studied for 50 years, which is not that long a time. My teacher, Swami Sheshananda, passed away in his 90s. He could recite the Gita by heart in English and Sanskrit in his 90s. So he, you know, he had been studying this for a very, very long time. And in fact, to close out our final class here, let's look at something I brought as kind of an afterthought. There's one of these new charts I'm working on called Mandala Charts. This is number 11 of 15 or so that have been created and haven't been seen yet by anyone. But I wanted to bring this out mentioning Swami Sheshananda, who's, uh, whose guru was Sri Sharda Devi, He's fortunate enough to be initiated by the Holy Mother in his own lifetime when he was young, and then brought her to the West and showed him, sh showed her to us. So some of the quotes on this chart might fall in line with these teachings of Brahmapada sporting about everything and also bring a final close to this third class on the subject where then we can look back on the YouTube classes and review it in Shravana Manana style. So at the bottom there you see this quote from her, if you pray to the master before his picture, then he manifests himself through that picture. The place where his picture is kept becomes a shrine. The master himself will pay close attention to such a place. So this could be a very hard thing for people who didn't understand bhakti, ritualism, image worship, deification of all things. But haven't we sort of paid deference to all things? Brahman is in everything all the way down to the element earth. It's in the written pages of a materialist book, you see, the, the materials of a book on its pages. It's, it's ink on paper, which is just earth. So you're finding Brahman reflected everywhere. And uh, if you're reading the book and not seeing Brahman as the foundation of it, you can get misled into lower knowledge or my knowledge. There's lower knowledge and then there's the ego's knowledge. Oh, I know this, now I can pass the test and I can get a job. That's lower knowledge, see. Ego's knowledge is, oh, I know this, now I'm mine, I'm going to make money off it. Or I'm going to impress others with it. So that's a nice quote from her about the master appearing in his own, in, inside the picture will emanate through the picture, just like in this chart, you see it emanating through all sorts of things, fish, trees, spring, water. 
And if you have the eyes to see, then you can see, oh, I see Brahman or Shakti. You can't hide from me. I've taken off the blindfold from my third eye, finally, over ages. So otherwise, you're wanting to try and own knowledge, and turn into an ego. Boy, have I got a conspiracy theory for you today. You're taking all of this knowledge and making it into something as silly as UFOs in space, when everything is in you. If there is a UFO in space, that's in you that it happened. Just like everything else here is in the mind, you are living in your mind. It's just how, how do you want that mind unbridled? Or do you want it blindfolded? That's up to you. I'll take in the time remaining another quote here. This time the master has come to save all. The rich, the poor, the wise, the foolish. Now there is a special Malaya breeze. Just set your sail a little. Take refuge in him and you will be blessed. Which so many of us are finding in this day and age but to speak of the five million, I've said world round, world, worldwide, even the Americans here with their death grasp on the material particle and uh, atoms and molecules and the power that comes from them are finding relief and respite from that kind of way of thinking, whether it be evolutionary theory of science or the seven day creation theory of religion that goes up. We're going inward to this great source of all wisdom and, and following the great souls that tell us the difference between the real and the unreal, and even let us see that the unreal Prakriti and its seeds come from the source. It'd be some if you didn't really know much, if you looked at a forest, you would never imagine that it came from seeds, would you? So even here on Earth, it's hard to see until you become a studier of Earth and you plant a seed and see something comes from it. So in that way, people in olden times, they thought the moon was being eaten by a dragon each night. The dragon took one bite of it <laughs> and another bite. That's how the moon went away. Somehow, I don't know how they figured it, but that dragon regurgitated it over the next cycle. And it come, somehow came back, you see. So they were thinking superstitiously like that. And if you looked at a forest, you wouldn't think of seeds if you weren't educated about it. So you must educate yourself about wisdom and how all seeds come from thoughts in the mind. And there are greater minds than you that are thinking these thoughts. And there's a place beyond the mind for even greater thinkers like we've been singing to here today. And maybe I'll end with a song because we've been taking some, pic some quotes by Shusharda Devi. The way they sing to her is more like this. Shada Devi Oh, Sharde, Vikya Vinashane, Sharde, Brahma Sanatani, Sharde, Prema Swarupine, Sharde, Patita Pavani, Sharde Karuna Rupini Sharde Namona Rayani Sharde O Divine Mother, Holy Mother of the Universe, Mahashakti, Mahamaya. You are the remover of all obstacles in our path, Brahma, Vikya Vinashane. You are the eternal principle of Brahman, Brahma Sanatani. You are the essence of divine love for God, Prema Swarupini. You are the savior of the fallen and the lowly, Patita Pavana. You are the essence of compassion for all suffering beings. Karuna Rupini. O oh, Mother of the Universe, Namo Narayani, salutations to thee. 
salutations to thee, salutations to thee.